to visit the wonderful world of the great outdoors with the Southern Sportsman, Frank White. Today's show is brought to you in part by House Autry, proven cornmeal and flour products. By Happy Jack, manufacturer of the all-new 3X flea collar. By Overton, the world's largest water sports dealer. And by the Southern Sportsman Game and Seafood Restaurant, the best foods from the field and the ocean. Today we will visit Crisfield, Maryland, where we will fish for Tangier trout and see the Crisfield Crab Derby, and we'll cook crab balls in the kitchen. The season is here for crabs, and whether you like them steamed, boiled, uh, crab cakes, and omelets, uh, whatever, uh, I like them that way too. And this is a real simple and easy little recipe. It's used quite often up on the eastern shore of Maryland and Virginia up through there, which is uh, the home of the crab in the summertime. And it's so simple and easy, I'm going to show you here. And I take about a half a cup of uh, seasoned bread crumbs, Italian seasoned bread crumbs, and use one large egg, or if, it's, uh, if they're smaller eggs, use a couple of small ones, about a quarter of a cup of mayonnaise, and the seasonings include a teaspoon of Worcester sauce, roughly, and a teaspoon of dry mustard. And we salt and pepper it to shape, uh, uh, to uh, taste, after I get my mustard in there. A little salt and some pepper. And we mix this up. Now, if it's too loose at this point, uh, when you add the crab meat, uh, you can uh, thicken it up a little bit by putting in a few more crumbs. If it's too damp uh, or, or if it's too dry, you can add mayonnaise and make it a little damper so you can work with it. And you're just going to mold it into balls, not cakes now, but uh, just small uh, balls about uh, one and a half inches in diameter. That's mixing up pretty good. We, we add our crab meat to it. The crab meat is already cooked, of course, if you buy it in this form. If you catch them live out there in the water snapping, you're going to have to cook them and pick them to get to this stage. But if you get it at the market, uh, the seafood market, it's already uh, been cooked. So you don't have to worry about that. Now, as you can see from this, and one reason these are so popular up there in Maryland, uh, they're, they're mostly all meat. There's just enough breading in there to hold it together and not much extra. And I've got the deep fat set over here, I hope on hot. Uh, I was testing it with a little water. Let me see how it sounds if I put a little drop of water in there. Yeah, I think it's uh, pretty hot. So you take it up and mold it into a ball about like this, about the size of a golf ball or a little larger. And it's practically all pure crab meat and drop it into the deep fat over here and just fry it about two or three minutes just until it's browned and done and ready to go. And they are delicious. You can serve them with a little tartar sauce, a little seafood sauce, or whatever kind of sauce you might want on the side. I'll tell you, if you've seasoned these right, you don't need anything on them. They cook up just great, just like that, exactly like they are. Crab balls, a very popular recipe uh, up on the eastern shore of Maryland and Delaware and Virginia, all up through there and uh, very popular at my house. I'll be back here in a minute. We're going up to Crisfield, Maryland. We're going to go out in Tangier Sound for some trout. We're going to visit the world famous uh, Crab Derby, the championship race up there, and see some fantastic crab picking uh, from some ladies that work up there as a living to pick crabs, and a whole lot of other stuff like that there. And it's all coming up in just a minute after these very important messages. Crisfield, Maryland is uh, on the eastern shore, right near the Maryland state line. It's almost in Virginia. The Virginia-Maryland line goes right through Pocomoke Sound right there in front of it. It's famous the world over for its crab industry. There is a great deal of crab landings brought to the dock up there, and a lot of uh, soft-shell crab shedding going on where I showed you, if you remember, 
Two or three weeks ago, I showed you uh, one of the crab shedding houses that was in Saxis, Virginia. Well, they were inside of each other, Saxis and Crisfield. They look at each other across Pocomoke Sound there. Only about eight miles separates them. And uh, crabbing up there in the summertime is big, big business. Uh, it is, of course, a delightful food to eat. I love them anyway. I love them steamed, boiled. I like crab cakes. I like uh, the crab balls that I'm cooking over there. I love it in omelets so just about any way. Uh, stuff a flounder with it. It's just great. And they uh, sort of celebrate the crab up there. They have a festival up, up there every year. But Chrisfield is also very important as a fishing port. A lot of commercial fisheries uh, watermen go out of there, and a lot of sport fishing boats go out of there. And where I'm going to take you first today to Chrisfield is a trip out into Tangier Sound. Now, we're going with Captain Charlie Mariner of the Traveler. Uh, Charlie works out of uh, Cape Charles during the early part of the season when the black drum are in down there and later when the trout move on up the bay, he moves his boat up to Crisfield. He's actually from Pocomoke, that's where he lives. This is Captain Charlie Mariner, one of the best charter boat captains on Chesapeake Bay, I think. This is my dad, Francis White from Alabama. He came up to visit and also my two daughters. And we've got a couple of my grandchildren along here today. This is a four-generation trip that we're going on. And to sort of celebrate that, the guy that was interested in it is Scorchy Talls. This is Scorchy. This is my grandson, David, by the way. And you'll see Lance here in just a minute. Scorchy Talls is the outdoor editor for Channel 16 at Salisbury, Maryland, WBOC. And he knew I was going on this trip. And he wanted to go along and kind of record it because you've got uh, father, grandfather, daughters, and sons and grandchildren here. My two daughters, Libby and Sean. Well, we cast off at one o'clock in the afternoon. They've been catching most of the fish late in the afternoon and then just at darkness. Uh, during the day, they were not picking up too many. This was an overcast day and we decided we'd go ahead. Charlie said, we'll take a run at it anyway. The weather prospects were not predicting a lot of, uh, a lot of stormy weather, a lot of squalls over the bay and high winds. Here's Lance White again and my daughter, Sean. This is my daughter, Libby, and her son, David, my grandson. And of course, the patriarch of the whole family was talking to Scorchy there. The mate is Arthur Merritt. And we had a friend uh, of all these guys, of Captain Charlie and of Arthur and Scorchy, uh, Paige Boston, who also is from Pocomoke. He's a chicken rancher. He raises chickens for one of those big chicken processing plants up there. Now you go out into Tangier Sound, which is uh, one canyon over from Chesapeake Bay. Uh, the, it's a separate body of water. I mean, they connect. You can go from one to the other. But this is the one that's right out in front of, uh, of Chrisfield. And it goes all the way up almost to Cambridge, Maryland, and it goes down uh, and joins Chesapeake Bay below Tangier Island in Virginia. But there are places there between Smith Island and Tangier Island and up at Hooper Strait you can connect into Chesapeake Bay. But this actually is more or less a separate body of water. And things were kind of slow. It looked like it's kind of fast there, but we caught one trout. Scorchy caught a trout. And we were picking up an occasional bluefish. But we moved a couple of times because we were having a hard time. And it was very, very hot. It, it was uh, the, almost no breeze. The water was calm in spite of what the weatherman had said uh, the real high winds did not materialize until I'm going to show you here in just a minute, until just at darkness, and then a couple of squalls came up, and that's what turned the fishing on when we really got into the trout. We're actu actually after the large gray trout that had made the fishing so famous up in Chesapeake Bay. Now, I've got a bluefish on here, and not a very big one at that. I had a lot of line out. We're anchored and fishing in about 70 feet of water. And even with a small fish like this, it takes a while to crank him up. Bluefish, of course, are, of course, are, are fun to catch. Great to catch, great game fish, great sport fish. And Lance, was he turned out to be the best fisherman of all. He, I'm pretty sure he caught the most fish. He's got, it's not really cold here. He's got a jacket on to protect him from the sun. He's very fair skinned and he burns. But he was having a great time catching these bluefish. But we were still hunting for and waiting on the big gray trout. 
to finally come to us. Now, this is not like drifting in Pamlico Sound where the water is more or less the same depth. You drift along a place, you might drift four or five miles and the water or depth may vary between 20 and 23 feet or something like that. Here you can drift 15 feet and it'll drop from 30 feet to 110 feet. So what you have to do is anchor and try to find the depth of water on the drop off where the fish are hanging, where they're waiting there. Libby's got to try this. She had a broken arm. And somebody said, how'd you break your arm? And she said, uh, I was teaching the kids how to roller skate. And this wit, whoever he was, says, well, it was a good thing you weren't teaching them how to hunt, wasn't it? And she thought that was funny. She's, uh, she's a good sport. But uh, she fell roller skating, teaching the kids how to roller skate, and broke her arm. And she was broken arm and all. She was catching fish, having a good time. Well, twilight approached. The sun began to sink into the west, and everybody in, on the boat practically had caught some fish except Papa, and I was getting a little worried about him because uh, he loves to fish. He's a man responsible, I guess, for me being in this business. He taught me the, to love the outdoors, hunting and fishing. He's done it his whole life. Lance has got another one here. He was having a good time. A lot of patience. This kid never turned his rod and reel loose all day. I mean, we'd get tired of sitting there waiting and we'd stick the rod in the rod holder, but not Lance. He held onto that rod and reel the whole time. And as a result, he didn't miss many strikes. He was there when the fish hit. These are nice gray trout. They're considered small in Chesapeake Bay. Down where I come from in Carolina, in Pamlico Sound, that would be a big fish. That's my daughter, Sean. She's got one on here. But these are nice trout. They were running, oh, I'd say from three to five or six pounds. But still, at this point, Papa had yet to catch a fish. And I was beginning to get a little worried. That happens sometimes, you know. You go and everybody on the boat will catch a fish, but you makes you feel kind of bad. And he wasn't saying much. But then the breeze got up. And the sun went down, and it turned the fish on. All of a sudden, they got ready, and they started hitting pretty good then. And we got into a nice little flurry of trout, just about there for just the last 30 or 40 minutes. That little squall hit, the water got rough, the fish got hungry, and Papa caught three nice trout, including this one. This is an eight pound gray trout. And that's still uh, not a giant compared to the 12 and 14 pound ones that are common in Chesapeake Bay and Tangier Sound. But he was very large for us. It was the largest gray trout that Popper had ever seen. And he was all smiles. He was having a good time there. He caught three trout just there right at the last minute, just to sort of save the day for him and for me because I wanted him to catch fish, of course. He carried me fishing all the time I was little, taught me how to fish and everything, and so I brought him up there and I wanted him to catch some fish because I love him very much. Uh, there is a big festival that goes on every Labor Day weekend at Crisfield, Maryland in honor of the Honorable Crab, and we're going to take a look at that in just a minute after these messages. The fishing season in Chesapeake Bay uh, starts uh, not soon enough after the, the waterfowl season is over, and that's, uh, that's my great love for going up there uh, on the eastern shore is the goose and the duck hunting up there. But sometime early in April, uh, or late April or early May, the trout start to move in, collect uh, in, and come into Chesapeake Bay. There's a big program up there to reclaim Chesapeake Bay. A great deal of it is polluted. Uh, they claim they're going to have to spend several billion dollars to clear it up, but a lot of fish up there have been in danger. Now, there doesn't seem to be much danger for the trout, and there certainly doesn't seem to be any danger right now for the crabs, but the rockfish have virtually disappeared. A lot of people think that's because of pollution of the spawning grounds, the spawning areas that the rockfish run into. 
Uh, but recently, Virginia raised the size limit on striped bass to 18 inches and reduced uh, the daily creel limit. And in Maryland, you can't take a striped bass at all. There's a moratorium up there, and it's illegal to catch a striped bass in Maryland right now. They hope that they'll get the bay cleaned up, and a lot of this will come back. For instance, the grass is beginning to come back, and, and that's a very good sign. But uh, the, I guess the king of it all it is the crab. And beginning about the middle of May, the, the crab shedding houses begin, and they shed literally hundreds and hundreds and thousands of soft-shell crabs. This is in Crisfield, Maryland, which honors the crab. And generally on Labor Day weekend, they have the crab festival and the crab derby. Now, uh, this is uh, open to all. This probably is the world's largest crab that you see here in the parade. But it's a Labor Day weekend sort of a tradition. And this is the Saturday before Labor Day. Everybody comes, thousands of people come from all over to see it. Uh, and they have crab races, they have contests to uh, show you how to make crab traps, the guy that can build a crab trap the quickest, they have all sorts of competition. This is a shedding float. Uh, they demonstrate to you, they let you see the crabs uh, as they are peeling, beginning the shed. He's showing how to tell when to peel a crab, and this is a female he's showing there. Uh, it's very educational, but it's also a lot of fun. Now, there's all kind of booths where you can get all sorts of seafood goodies, crab cakes and soups and chowders and just everything in the world, clams, uh, every kind of seafood you can imagine, you can get there. And that'll give you some idea of the crowd that gathers there. Boats come in from all over. People drive down in cars. Crisfield is sort of a cul-de-sac. It's sort of an, it's out on a peninsula. And you can only go so far by car, and then you got to get in either an airplane or a boat to go any further. Among the festivities they have uh, is uh, the crab picking contest. This is a look of the arena, the amphitheater that they have set up. And all the various crab houses around there choose their champion crab picker to come in. Uh, these ladies make a living doing this. If you've ever tried to pick a crab, you're gonna appreciate what I'm gonna tell you here in just a minute, because picking a crab is not easy, and I even went to school once. I went down and took some lessons on how to pick crabs, but uh, I'm a slow picker. I can just about keep up with my appetite. I can just about pick as fast as I want to eat it, and at that, I'm working uh, to keep up with my appetite, and then about three or four hours, I have enough. I've been able to pick enough to make myself a meal out of it. Uh, watch these gals go to work. They are something else. And the winner on this particular occasion was a lady. Now they're judged on how fast they pick. You notice if she drops one, she just goes right on. And uh, they're picking the, the body meat. They're judged on the least amount of shell in there and the poundage, the weight that they pick. And the lady that won picked four pounds and a quarter, four pounds and four ounces. There's Scorchy Talls with WBOC Television. He was there to film this for his station as I was there to film it for the network. But the lady that won it picked four pounds and four ounces in 15 minutes. Now that's running somewhere on, on, on the, if, I, if my computer is working, that's 17 pounds an hour. And that is lots and lots of crab meat. Now, one of the great, this is, probably, this is the climax, I guess, of the whole thing. They lined up 50 crabs, one from each state. A lot of the states that have their own crabs send them, but you take Nebraska, Omaha, they don't have any, so they pick one for them. Number 26 was North Carolina, and of course, I was rooting for number 26, good old North Carolina. Uh, but they put them in the gate. This is like a horse race, and the first one across the finish line wins. Here they lining them up getting ready to go, and you're going to see 50 crabs, or just like the Kentucky Derby, friends and neighbors, except more fun, I think. And at the starting signal, they tip down the trays, and they shake them a little bit to urge them, and guess what? First one out of the chute was number 26. And you know what he did? Did he dash across the line? He did not. He picked a fight with the guy right next to him. I don't know who he's got there in an arm lock, but he's got uh, uh, Nebraska or... South Dakota or somebody there. But good old number 26 for North Carolina dashed out, ran about uh, 12 inches, 
and jumped on his neighbor right next door, and they had a big fight. Last we seen of them, I don't think they're still lying there, uh, or Indian wrestling, or arm wrestling. Uh, the last we seen with them, I think they went into a pot. Uh, which was a just fate, I think, for somebody that can't keep his mind on racing and wants to pick uh, a fight anyway. Uh, that big festival is held up there on Labor Day weekend, and if you haven't got plans for Labor Day weekend, and if you think you might like to go up there, I recommend it to you very highly. The food up there is great. Uh, the crowds are very congenial. It, the atmosphere is marvelous with all the boats and everything like that up there on the seashore, the eastern shore of Maryland, uh, the town of Crisfield. I, commend the, the Crab Derby to you uh, this Labor Day weekend. Maybe I'll see you there. I'll be back here in a minute with a final word after this. Go ahead and cook up some more of these because as soon as the lights go out, uh, they're going to get a chance to dive into them if they want to. Here's what they look like, uh, the crab balls, when they're cooked. They're practically all pure crab meat, as you can see there. There's just a little bit of breading uh, to hold them together, and uh, they are delicious. I enjoyed my trip up there, and I shot more film, and next week we're going to show you some of it up there. We're going up uh, in Chesapeake Bay, and we're going to troll for some trout and some bluefish, and uh, we're going to show you how to make bucktails. And that's all coming up next week. In the meantime, please do not litter, and do yourself a favor. Take a kid fishing. The Southern Sportsman has been brought to you in part by House Autry Cornmeal and Flo